not the one that I'll be giving because our country is in a situation that is calling me to address it. Um, it wasn't easy, friends, because there's always the possibility that what I say in response to such circumstances as we have going on in our country right now is that it will inflame others and yet it's something that I simply have to risk. You know, today we as individuals and as a nation are standing in the wake of heartbreaking and violent actions of a police officer, Derek Chauvin, against a man named George Floyd. During this encounter, we know that Floyd died. Protesters, both peaceful and violent, are now crying out for justice. Massive riots are taking place in major cities from coast to coast. More lives are being threatened, and entire communities are being destroyed and looted by angry protesters. More heartbreak, more violence, more destruction, more pain, more suffering. The call for justice is absolutely understandable. The anger and outrage against misuse of authority is definitely understandable, and it will not fix the problem. Violence can never overcome violence. The moment violence enters the picture is the moment that our judgment is misguided. We stop listening to each other and compassion is no longer a part of our response. We lose sight of each other as part of the same human family deserving of our love and respect. And so by the time we're finished here today, my prayer is that we'll be able to hold both the perpetrators of injury and the injured with compassion. It's our only way to true healing and to true transformation of suffering. There is no question our lives are undeniably being shaken and altered by these events. And yet the event itself is not all there is. The event is simply an acting out of years and years and years of discrimination and injury, exclusion. Friends, I have to say, in my heart I believe this is not a black and white issue. This is an issue of humanity against humanity. It's something we've done again and again in our country with different ethnic groups, different people with different colored skins, people who have different religious beliefs or moral values. And it's really, it's time now for us to simply stop the injury and to stop disowning one another as being brothers and sisters. You know, we're all just touched and changed by the shock and the sadness of it all. We all share the struggle to cope with the depth of pain that it's causing. Through the heartbreak and the loss, we're trying to make sense out of how and why such things continue to happen. We struggle with why there is such a divide between races and other groups. Now, how can there be such disrespect and disregard for one another? I find no satisfactory answers, only the choice. The choice to let these tragic events make us violent too or to have them inspire us to be personally part of transforming the needless suffering. This is not to minimize in any way at all these heartbreaking events that are in our face right now or to try and make them something good. They are not. 
It is saying that even from these horrific experiences, if we are open to it, we can find ways to bring forth more love and healing in our own lives, in our communities, and in the world. We are at choice point for transforming the suffering of centuries of pain. If we decline to do this transformative work, the violence of these shattering events will consume us with pain, bitterness, and thoughts of revenge. Violence can never overcome violence. Violence fixes nothing. It simply continues an ever-worsening injury. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, as my sufferings mounted, I soon realized that there were two ways in which I could respond to my situation, either to react with bitterness or seek to transform the suffering into a creative force. I decided to follow the latter course. And I don't believe that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was being a martyr in any way at all when he said that. He simply knew that violence would not fix the problem, but that somewhere we had to look beneath the violence to find the creative force to change things. See, we can choose to respond to even the worst experiences with a desire to transform our suffering into a creative force. In times of tragedy, it is understandable that in addition to grief, we might feel anger, fear, hopelessness, helplessness, and despair. However, especially in these times such as this, it's important to remember that there is only one path to peace. Only one thing that can heal our hurt. One thing that can overcome hate and violence. One thing that can transform our suffering into a creative force. One thing that can bring some form of good from this tragedy. And that one thing is love. In the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 34, it's recorded that Jesus said, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. There were no exclusions in that statement. There were no parameters, no barriers, no requirements, no checklist of things that one had to be in order to be loved. He simply said, do it. Love one another as I have loved you. And how did he love us? Well, he loved us unconditionally, intentionally, and consistently. Loving one another is our whole life purpose, our reason for being here. In these days of turmoil and hurt, it's easy to forget that. But we must for the benefit of ourselves and the entire world, we must make a conscious effort to remember, to pray, and open our hearts to God's love, allowing it to soothe, comfort, and calm us, to bring peace, and to remind us that every person is a child of God, even one who does unspeakable things and his or her most fundamental self is still a child of God. It is a fact that in this human experience there are those whose thoughts become distorted and they take actions that are definitely not in alignment with their true nature as a child of God. Even so, the truth of their identity as a lovable child of God remains the same. It is my firm belief that no one acts out in violence and rage. No one 
injures another unless they have forgotten their identity as a child of God. And so it is incumbent upon us to remind them and to hold them in that consciousness in our own thinking and behavior. See, regardless of words spoken and actions taken, every person retains their spiritual innocence as a spiritual being. They remain a container of the God seed, as Meister Eckhart described us. In unity, we believe that every person, without exception, has within them the Christ spirit, which can never be affected by anything of this world. We always have the choice to live in accord with our indwelling Christ spirit or not. And sadly, some are choosing not to live in accord with that, and yet we know they have the potential to do so. When we live in accord with our Christ spirit, we can see the facts of our experiences and the events around us. We can see the circumstances that are painful and have caused the suffering. And we can do so with honesty and with integrity. We can see that. And we can choose to respond to those facts from the consciousness of the Christ spirit, the spirit of love. See, Jesus modeled this kind of love in his response to a situation that was most assuredly headed for violent actions. The story is recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. And what the scripture there tells us, that early one morning, Jesus had come down from the Mount of Olives, and he went into the temple to pray. Well, when the people saw him, many of them came and crowded around him and wanted to learn from him. So he sat down and he began to teach them. Well, Jesus and the people who had gathered around him were very soon interrupted by the entry of scribes and Pharisees who were forcefully bringing a woman to stand in front of Jesus. They, it sounds as if they probably kind of dragged her into the temple and said, here, look at this. So there she's standing in front of Jesus, and they say to him, teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. You know that in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? So, of course, this was coming to Jesus as a test or a challenge because these people, the Pharisees and the scribes, were deeply troubled by Jesus and his ministry. They thought that his message of love and his ability to attract such large crowds and perform miracles was really threatening to their ability to stay in power. So they were hoping to force him to speak against their laws so that they would have a reason to bring some charge against him. So that's the backdrop for the story. But to their surprise, Jesus said nothing. He simply bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And they kept on questioning him, and he stood up and said, let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Jesus was a master psychologist, you see. <clears throat> he understood the truth of the matter. And then, after he had said that, he simply stooped down and began scribbling in the dirt again, still <clears throat> not really paying much attention to the scribes and Pharisees. But when the scribes and Pharisees heard what he said, their consciences kicked in and they went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. They just drifted right on out the door. And then Jesus stood up and seeing that there was no one with him but the woman, 
he asked her, Woman, where are your accusers? Has any man condemned you to enforce legal action against you? She answered, No, not a one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I hold any judgment against you or condemn you. Go, and do not make the same mistake again. So in this story, Jesus had given the perfect demonstration of how love and non-judgment can transform suffering. He made no judgment against the scribes and the Pharisees or the woman. He was aware that the scribes and Pharisees were attempting to set him up so they could arrest him. He was aware of the woman's actions, which according to Mosaic law were wrong and could legally result in her being stoned, possibly to death. He saw all of those facts and chose to transform the suffering in the moment through love. So without malice, he diverted the attention of the punitive scribes and Pharisees with the simple act of not responding to their anger, but instead silently stooping down and scribbling something with his finger in the dirt as if he did not hear them. Now the scripture doesn't tell us what Jesus wrote in the dirt, because it's not important. The point is, he did not respond to the scribes and Pharisees with anger and aggression. He knew they were frightened, that their ego-driven men that had spiritually not matured enough yet into the ability to love one whom they deemed immoral and wrong, unfit to be included in their community. Jesus demonstrated as much compassion for their immaturity as for the woman's. He invited the scribes and the Pharisees to look at themselves and take action accordingly. Of course, they knew that they too had made mistakes and would not want to be stoned for them. He invited the woman to love herself enough to never again act in ways that would be degrading and self-destructive. He offered a consciousness and a demeanor of love and acceptance for all. He acted as the presence of love and peace in the midst of violence. And that is what I'm inviting every one of us into today, to be the presence of love and peace, even in the midst of the violence or the chaos and the upset that we see going on around us. You know, we can call for justice and accountability from a consciousness of compassion and respect for all people. I'm not talking about ignoring things that really need to be healed and dealt with. I'm talking about approaching them from a consciousness of love and peace from within ourselves. Because if we go to anything with violence will simply create more violence. And I know that some will resist ideas of oneness and love, but the truth remains that if we allow ourselves to have a violent response to the violence in our world, we become part of the wave of intolerance, hatred, and aggression that is so prevalent in our world today. Violence can never overcome violence. Peace depends upon our individual awakenings to greater love. Our sole work then is to lift our consciousness to the level of love even in the face of violent acts, to deny the power of violence to destroy love. Japanese author and Zen Buddhist philosopher D.T. Suzuki said, however insistently the blind may deny that existent, the existence of the sun, they cannot annihilate it. And so no matter how many violent, aggressive individuals in the world deny love, deny our oneness, deny our potential for peace with all people, they cannot annihilate the truth of it. I want to share with you a prayer that was written by Unity Minister Reverend Linda Martella Whitsitt 
which I believe is a beautiful example of how we can pray to be a positive influence in the midst of this crisis. We who are in agony, erupting in outrage, our river of tears is flowing. We bathe in these waters until they subside and we become still. In the silence, fresh waters flow, nourishing infinite love and divine wisdom, seeping into the gaping crevices of our broken open hearts and minds. Out of the silence, we can speak. Out of the silence, we can act. We can acknowledge and sit with the pain and the anger, allowing it to flow through us until we are empty of the distress. Then, in the silence, fresh waters, new insights, new wisdom flows into our wounded places, and then we can speak and act in ways that are wise and loving. Prayer is the foundation of healing our own suffering and making us ready to help other people heal theirs. It's important that we stand united in love and faith as we pray for the violent ones and their targets. Let us take action according to divine guidance. We must not let anger hurt and violence divide us and turn us against one another. It won't be easy to stand united in love and not allow hate to divide us, but we must. If there is to be transformation of our personal and collective suffering. And I don't know about you, friends. I suspect it's true for you, too. But I am absolutely tired of being in pain because we have not understood yet how to love and respect one another. I find it enormously painful to watch us treating each other with such disregard. It's paramount for us to remember that we have the power to transform our suffering into a creative force for good and to make the world a better, more loving, more equitable, more peaceful place. And so, the affirmation that I have for you today is this. I have the power to transform suffering into a creative force for good. See, that's the truth of the matter. We have the power to transform suffering into a creative force for good. Mahatma Gandhi once said, be the change you want to see in the world. And every week we close our services by singing, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. It is an affirmation of our willingness to be the change, to let peace begin with us as individuals. It is our commitment as individuals and as a community to let peace begin with us, to let love begin with us, to let compassion and kindness begin with us, to let respect and acceptance begin with us, to let comfort and healing begin with us. Let peace begin with me. Let peace begin with us. Together, we can take ownership of love and peace and become active agents in transforming suffering into a creative force for good that will bring forth a compassionate, loving world for all, where attitudes of love, mutual respect, acceptance, and kind-heartedness become the norm for people everywhere. And so I invite you to close your eyes if you wish, 
I have a prayer I'd like to share with you that was written by Rabbi Harold Kushner, who is the author of When Bad Things Happen to Good People. And it speaks to my heart. I pray it will speak to yours. Let the rain come and wash away the ancient grudges, the bitter hatreds held and nurtured over generations. Let the rain wash away the memory of the hurt, the neglect. Then let the sun come out and fill the sky with rainbows. Let the warmth of the sun heal us wherever we are broken. Let it burn away the fog so that we can see each other clearly, so that we can see beyond labels, beyond accents, gender, or skin color. Let the warmth and brightness of the sun melt our selfishness so that we can share the joy and feel the sorrows of our neighbors. And let the light of the sun be so strong that we will see all people as our neighbors. Let the earth, nourished by rain, bring forth flowers to surround us with beauty. And let the mountains teach our hearts to reach upward to heaven. And because we allow it to be so, so it is. Amen. God bless you, my friends, as you go forth to be a part of transforming suffering through love. <coughs>